Well, today's Father's Day. And so it's right that we stop and we honor the fathers. Dads, it's kind of tough being a dad today. Uh, the environment the world has put us in uh, has made it difficult sometimes. Uh, there's a growing lack of respect for fathers, for the position of father. And as men have walked away from the homes, in many cases it has made that problem even harder. Today's society of couples getting together and having children outside of wedlock has made things more difficult. I counsel uh, young couples, in fact, I don't perform any marriages if they don't subject themselves to counsel. And I've had some couples go, we don't need that. We've been living together for three years, and preacher, we don't need your counsel. And I go, well, then I won't perform your ceremony. <coughs> because you see, what you've been doing, you've been out there living your life the way the world tells you to, and you're asking me as a representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ to come in and bring a level of holiness into your matrimony, into your ceremony, and you're refusing godly counsel. So I will not participate in this union. There's things God intended for our families. And one of them is that there's a mother and a father. He's blessed it that way. He, his word consistently guides us along that way. If you're not going to abide by God's word, then you don't need the lip service of God's word. It's confusing for the world, for us as Christians or those that claim Christ as our Lord and Savior to walk one way and say another. We need to be consistent. But on a special occasion as today, like Father's Day, I want to um, somewhat systematically break down some of the things that God's Word says about fathers. In my own family, I've, I've seen what divorce has done. I've got a son who is divorced, and I've seen some of the problems that it has. I've got grandchildren that has a Daddy Mike and a Daddy Matt and a Daddy Ted. And it becomes confusing to these children who they can depend on. They've got all these names. I see the issues it has during the holidays of Thanksgiving of where people are going to go, where they're going to celebrate, who's going to cut the turkey. Christmas, where are they going to spend it? It disrupts a lot of lives and a lot of families because many times we're just not following and doing what God has said. That's what it boils down to. I tell young couples that you have 100% chance of your marriage being successful. God did not create it to fail. He created it to succeed. And if you'll follow what God has laid out for you to do, you have 100% chance of having a successful marriage. The problems come in when we detour from God's way. So let's talk a little bit about what God says about a father. I believe Christian fathers need to step up to the plate 
and execute the role that God has placed before them and assigned to our hearts and our hands for us to do. What then is the role of a Christian father in today's compromising society? Let's look at the Bible in a few minute, for a few minutes today and I think the answer will become clear. If you've got your Bible, open up to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. The first four verses. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. This will be our opening text this morning as our main text. But let's open it up to this familiar verse and ver set of verses and, and read it and we'll get started on what God's Word has to say about fathers. And it starts here with children. You can't be a father without children, can you? So the first word is children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee. Thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Then it goes on to servants and some other areas about these things. But it starts out with a Christian father or a godly father should not provoke their children to wrath. And today society sits down and you hear words uh, like, my old, my old man won't let me do that. Well, being a daddy myself and being a father, I know there's many times I've had to tell my family and my children no. And they get disappointed in those things. And the, I've, been, I've been to schools and I've been to the counselor's office with my kids and they talk to me about how when they, they blend the wording of being disappointed with anger. And there's a difference between being disappointed in something and being angry with something. You see, if I'm planning on going fishing on Friday afternoon and it rains, I'm not angry, I'm disappointed. Why am I going to be angry because it rains? It disrupted my plans. But no cause to be angry. Plenty of cause to be disappointed. And today our school systems and our counseling, they blend those two words of disappointment with anger as being the same thing. And now with that redefinition of the word disappointment, meaning anger, sometimes daddies don't want to make our children angry when in fact we may disappoint them. We may disappoint them. But our one of our responsibilities is to give guidance to things. Not to build walls around things, but to put limits on things. It's more like it's more like a, a, a guardrails. Operate within these boundaries, you're safe. These are the right things to do. We're going to talk about that a little bit more just a, in just a moment. But the first thing Paul tells fathers in Ephesians is, is this. It says, don't provoke your children. Don't provoke your children. <laughs> Let me explain it this way. It doesn't mean what you probably think that means. Not to provoke your children probably does not mean what you think. It doesn't mean to make them happy and please them all the time. Not to provoke your children means to establish some guidelines for them. Not to provoke your children means to allow them to find their way of being productive and flourishing within, within what their talents are. Having, having six children, Valerie and I, it's been a challenge finding or helping them find what they're supposed to do. Micah used to go to work with me 
when I was a director of technology and he used to pull wires through the ceilings and rebuild computers and swap out parts and so forth and, and so forth and he enjoyed that. Matthew, he enjoys using a computer and playing games. If it's broke, he calls Micah. Micah likes working on the things. Matthew likes playing on the things. Daniel, give him a motorcycle. He's left the medical field. Uh, he was a Navy corpsman, served in Afghanistan a few times, and uh, did a real good job. Got out, he decided he wanted to build motorcycles. Stephen, trying to get a degree for teaching. He works at CVS, which is the same job he's had since he was a junior in high school. He's been with them a long time. And now he thinks what he wants to do is work with travel trailers and travelers at campgrounds and live in a camper. I hope he changes his mind. Anna, she worked for Zaxby's for a little while, Sonic for a little while, and for the last, what, eight years she's been with Starbucks. She makes your coffee. She works two shifts, works all the time. I've gone in a store with her working and she, the way she runs and hustles and takes care of people, it makes me proud. Each one of these children are different. <coughs> it's a father's responsibility to help their child find where God wants them. Not to provoke them into an area not to force them, but to nurture them and to, and to help them find their way. Dads have to say no. Dads' discipline is, is there. And it, dads enforce the rules of the family. It's when a child is not given this direction that they don't feel the love of the father, the overseeing of the daddy. That insecurity will bring about some wrath. It's the lack of guidance and oversight that kindles the wrath that will provoke a child into that. One of the biggest problems of modern society today is what psychologists are calling daddy longing. Dads are not always there to discipline and love, or they are there, but they're too busy to show the love, or they were raised by a daddy who never showed love himself. He's very cold. Many of y'all have heard my stories about my dad. I, I got a broke nose, a broke jaw. I was hauled off and dumped on the side of the road. I was, I, was in it. I was a mistake. My daddy already had four kids. That's all he wanted. I was a mistake. I was told my entire life I would never amount to anything and that I could never pay him back for what it cost him by me being born. So it was difficult for me to build a relationship with him. But within church and the guidance of my mama, I was introduced to a loving father who abides in heaven who knows my name. Who oversees me. And I praise God today that he even corrects me and stops me and tells me no at times. My father is not too busy to show that he loves me. But many children today have physical daddies who don't have the time to give them the direction they need. It's, it's, it's created a culture of divorce. Broken homes and latchkey kids are usually angry. Children that are raised in homes that daddies are not present, you'll find more anger in those children. You'll find more rebellion within 
those families. You see, discipline isn't what just provokes wrath with children. It's the lack of love that makes children angry and causes problems. It's the lack of the guardrails around their lives and that security that a daddy can give that causes these things to creep into the home. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And let's look at this just a moment. We've got daddies and we got moms too that refuse to give discipline nowadays because they don't want to upset the children. Remember what I said about that disappointment and anger, how we blended that word in society today? And if your child is disappointed because they can't go to wild adventures because the family finances are such that might create a problem that now are your days, oh, I'm mad at them. Well, they're really just disappointed. And we're interchanging that word. You need to redefine this with your children and help them understand. I love you. We just can't do that, okay? Or I've got a. We're, we've got something else we're doing. <coughs> Explain it to them. But let's read in Proverbs chapter three, eleven and twelve. My son, despise despise not the chastening chastening of the Lord. Neither be weary of his correction. You're going to be chastened by God. He is going to reach out to you and He's going to give you that correction. And it says, don't, be, don't grow weary of His correction. God's going to adjust you a little bit. Reading on verse 12. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father the son in whom He delighteth. If the Father's paying enough attention to correct you, to, to chastise you, to, to give you that correction, He's watching you close enough, and the reason He's watching you is because He loves you. And daddies, we need to understand, fathers today, we need to understand, we need to watch our children enough to understand how to correct them and when they need the correction. If we give that all over to the mama. Mamas, mamas are, are nurturing. God created mamas to be nurturers. They nurture. And we give that over. We give these responsibilities sometimes over to mamas. And their gift from God is to be nurturers. And then we throw the correction on mama. Now they're nurturers and they're giving correction. And it starts to overload. And it also takes the daddy out of a position within the children's lives. It's one of our responsibilities as men to correct our children, just as our Heavenly Father does. Turn in your Bibles over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's read again what God says about daddies in this area of correction. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 9. Hebrews chapter 12, 5 through 9. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. These, these words that, that, that are being spoken to us tells us we're going to be chastened. We're also going to be rebuked. We're going to be given correction. By who? By God, by the Lord. He's going to correct us. He's going to chastise us. He's going to give us that correction. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth chasten not? Every child of God is going to be chastened. Every one of our children, fathers, need to, need to have that correction or adjustment in their life. It's, it's, it's a godly thing to do. If you love them, if you've received them as your children, you're going to chasten them, as the Bible is saying. But verse, verse 8, look at this. But if ye be without chastening... We're of all our partakers. How many? Who, who's all partakers of this chastening? Oh. It says all, right? All are partakers, uh, partakers. Then you are illegitimate and not sons. You're illegitimate. You don't have a father is what it's saying. And are not sons. If you, if you don't get chastened, you don't have a daddy. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? If we're going to make ourselves, allow ourselves to be subject to physical fathers, then, then we also have to give way to the spiritual side of who the Lord is in our life and accept that correction. There again, we have, we have stood there and, and many times have, have, have talked about how we've given our lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ and He's our Lord and we have a Father in Heaven, but we don't accept His correction. We don't take His counsel. We don't take His teaching. We reject it. We replace it with other things. We do that in our physical homes. Our homes become disarray, in disarray. We, they become out of order. And so much more in our spiritual lives when God's Word sits down and tells us something and we receive instruction from the Lord and we disregard it, then our spiritual lives will become in disarray as well. The second thing Paul says to fathers is a word of counsel. After telling dads what not to do, he tells them what they should do and that they should have nurturing. So what does dad's nurturing look like? It talks about the nurture of the Lord. Just like a farmer raises tender plants and waters them and covers them from the frost and feeds them with fertilizer and sees that they get enough water on them. Till they grow tall and they produce their crops. So fathers are to nurture their children in the Lord. Now someone will say that it's just spoiling them. You know, uh, you're not spoiling them by making sure they're nurtured, that they, they are given what's necessary to grow into the area that they that God intends for them to, to grow. Y'all know, y'all know, y'all know of my scooter, my little dog. I like my little dog. And everything, and people tell me all the time, you spoil him. He's got his little stacks, and during dinner time and so forth, he knows right where to sit beside me to get little bits and pieces and that kind of thing, and so forth. And people have sat down, and especially my kids, they say, Dad, you spoil that dog. And I go, Well, when we eat, he gets to eat too, doesn't he? Yeah. And he has toys? Yeah. I said, sounds like, sounds like one of you kids. Did I spoil all you kids? Oh, no, you didn't spoil us. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to them, it's like I took a belt to them and beat them all the time. But they had all their meals and they had their toys and they got to play baseball and went to dance class and all those types of things. And I, haven't, I have not paid for any dance classes for Scooter. And he had yeah. to went to play baseball. <laughs> So I think I've spoiled my kids more than I have my dog. But I've nurtured my dog. And I've loved and I've nurtured and I've raised my children. Seeing that they have the things to enhance their lives, it's not spoiling them. It's nurturing them. It's what God intends. 
If God only gave you what you needed, you'd be in shabby clothes, a lean-to in the woods somewhere, and really want me to dismiss you so you can get out and eat as soon as possible. But we've all been blessed and overfed, and we got good clothes. In fact, if you walked in some of our homes, you'd probably find even some clothes that are laid out on the bed or someplace and not put up because we've got some extra clothes. Many of us got more than one vehicle to drive. We have a thing once a year we try to take. It's called vacation because we got extra time on our hands that we can go do that. And we don't have to go out in the fields and work so that we can eat this week. God has blessed us so much. Has He spoiled us? Maybe He's just nurtured us. He's loved on us. Biblically, nurturing is having a godly foundation in love and living by an example. It requires time. It requires attention. Look back in Deuteronomy. Look back over in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's read a couple of verses, beginning at verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, hear, O people of New Prospect, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Let me read that again. And these words which I command thee this day. There's that word we don't like as Americans. We're being commanded. And he's telling us something. Shall be in where? Your heart. Verse 7. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Men, we need to teach God's Word. Once it's in our heart, we need to teach our children what God said. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. When we're sitting around, we need to talk to them about the things the Lord would have us to do. And when thou walkest by the way, we need to share with them God's way. And when thou liest down, we need to have God's Word being shared with our children. And when thou risest up, when you get up in the morning, your job is to help share God's Word with your children. And when thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and thou shalt be as frontless between your eyes. They ought to be with you. They ought to be on your, in the fore, your, for, on your forehead, in your hand. Now you 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 study you study Orthodox Jewish culture and so forth, and you'll find that during times they literally attach the prayers to a box on their forehead and go and pray. You're talking about on the front ones between their eyes. It ought to be up there. Now, don't you know that kids would ask their daddy, "What's that on your face? You've got a box tied to your forehead." The Jewish daddies would take that time to teach them this is God's Word. And I've written it and I've put it on my forehead so that I might not forget it. Now that sounds odd. But you've got you've to you've take God's Word pretty serious to put it in a box and tie it to your forehead. And your kids would think it's <coughs> odd and ask questions. What is that? But it gives you the opportunity to explain how important the God, Word of God is. Verse 9, And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on your gates. <clears throat> when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking in the way, when you lay down at night, when you rise up during the day, all during your day, what's God's Word tells you in Deuteronomy? To share the Word of God with your kids. And how many times has it has it has, has opportunity given, Daddy, where you've sat down and you've never mentioned God's word or God's way about things, but let your kids grow up like a road weed, growing any way they want to without any guidance from the Lord God Almighty. 
But the book of Deuteronomy tells us that all during our day, our rising and our going down, our sitting down, our laying down, as we walk along, we need to be talking and admonishing our kids to live for God and what God's Word is. It starts out, we're supposed to hide these things in our heart and live by them, daddies, but then we're supposed to share these things with our kids. We're supposed to talk to them. You need to know God's Word. You need to know how God wants us to live. The last thing Paul says to fathers is a word of encouragement. After counseling them to nurture their children, he also encourages them to, to admonish their children. Now what does the word admonish mean? It means to teach them. It means to teach your kids. The most important lesson, daddies, you can teach your kids is what God's Word says and how God tells them to live. They need to be in the house of the Lord at the appointed time. They need to honor His Word. They need to know His Word. They need to understand it. They don't need to know the rules and the regulations of the church. They need to know God's Word. They don't need to be raised as religious robots. They need to be uh, raised to be able to understand that in the name of Jesus, they have the right to approach the Father's throne and to ask whatever you will, Jesus said, in His name, and the Father will do it. We need to teach our children. Paul gives instruction to Christian parents. The idea is that God designated the Christian home to fulfill the needs of these children. Everyone knows that mothers are the nurturers, but dads are called to nurture these children too. In addition to that, dads are to admonish their children. Where moms are mainly the nurturers, dads are mainly the teachers, the admonishers of God's Word. Dad, if you don't teach your children how to work, the world will teach them how to steal. If you don't teach your sons how to love and respect a woman, the world will teach them how to be a gigolo and use women. <laughs> If you don't teach your child honesty, the world will teach them to be a cheat. What are the life lessons fathers must teach or admonish their children? Let me break it down three main areas. Dads, if you got a pen and pencil, write this down. This is important. Those who are taking notes, write this down. The three life lessons that fathers should teach their children. First, fear God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that the first thing you need to teach your children is fear God. Not to be afraid of God, but to honor and respect every word He says, every intent of His heart. To pay close attention to it. Fear God. Second, love God. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 tells us that, that we need to love God with everything in us. That He needs to be number one in our lives. That He takes priority in all things. If God is number one in our lives, then fishing isn't an option when it comes to the things of God. If God is number one in our lives, Going on the four-wheeler isn't, isn't an option. When it comes to the things of God, God comes first. God comes first. God comes first. All the other things will be added to you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these other things can be added to you. They'll all fit in someplace. You can go fishing. You can go four wheeling. You can go uh, water skiing. You can go out camping. You can go out to the movies. You can go out to all these things. But it teaches you or it admonishes you to seek first the kingdom of God. And then fit in the world around it. Let God be number one. 
So fear God's the first thing. Love God's the second life principle that you need to teach your children. And the third, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, is to obey God. Not just to know it, but to obey it. These little sticky notes here, as you learn them, your life should be really, what did I learn? Did I apply? Lord, what would you have me to learn off of this, these verses today? You could write them down and you apply them again. Lord, is there something else? Yes. Without applying them, they don't mean anything. You need to obey God. Not just know what He says. Out front this morning, Brother Ray walked up, had his Bible out and everything. He said he's reading his Bible early this morning. I said, what are you doing? Cramming for finals? <laughs> you know, and he said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. You know, once we get up to heaven, I don't believe there's going to be a test. The only thing that's going to happen is that the Lord's going to look into a book called the Book of Life to see if our name's there. And if it's there, we come in. If it's not, we're not allowed. But there won't be this, there won't be this, how long did you go to church? Were you a member of a certain church? But it'll be real important that what God has taught you or admonished you, that you've applied. The things that you have learned, have you applied these things? If you learned them, but not applied them, you're no different than anybody else in the world. It's the applying of God's Word to your life that you start to appear to be different. Without applying it, nobody knows any difference. If you don't apply it, you don't know there's any difference. You act like the world, talk like the world. Kind of like that duck. Walk like a duck, talks like a duck. Guess what? Might be a duck. You need to apply the things of God in your life Today we honor fathers and we thank God for His grace and wisdom in instituting the family, the Christian family that has a mom and a dad in it. We need to strive to follow the blueprint that God has designed. Some families have messed up. There's been mistakes. There's not a daddy in the home. There's maybe not a mama. It's a little bit different, but God can fix those things. If you follow God's principles and admonish your children and nurture your children, you can still be successful. If you're not a Christian, it starts with that. How can you teach somebody the things of Christ without Christ in your heart? And be like me trying to teach you how to tune up a race boat. And I don't want to have a race boat. <clears throat> if you don't have Christ in your life, you can't give that counsel. If you don't have Christ, you might, you might have all the head knowledge in the world but your testimony is so weak, nobody wants to take your advice. Church, you need Jesus. If you don't have Jesus in your life, that's where it starts. If you don't have Jesus, you're not saved. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, your name's not written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the important thing when you get to heaven. Make sure your name's written in that book. And the way you get your name written, it isn't attending church. It's not doing good works. It's not giving a bunch of money. It's giving your life to Jesus Christ and following Him or applying what He teaches 
to your life because he's your Lord. You become obedient to him. There's a lot of dissatisfied people that's joined the church and walked out dissatisfied because they never gave their heart to Jesus. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to apply the things of God to your life. You need to live for Him. If you're not saved, I give you the invitation. As the music is playing, you need to come down. You need to make a public profession of faith. know you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, we have that opportunity right now. We're going to dismiss in just a few minutes, but we're going to give you that opportunity. Do you have a Heavenly Father? Or as the text today said, you're illegitimate. You don't have a daddy. You can have one today. at all. You need the altar. Altars are open. We'll be dismissing. If you would stand and bow your heads and close your eyes and we'll dismiss.